welcome to the esoteric music death spiral. Uh... Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, the, the slow tears of joy. I am not your that... host, Ray the... Oh, fuck. Your actual host is Noise Bandit. Hello, uh, I am me. The man, the myth, the legend. The yeah. orange man with the orange moogie moon. hair. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So and also with hair. us is is Princess Plunderphonics, aka Max. Ah, uh, the NB, the story, the legend, myth person. All right. Nice to know that there's a tornado going on. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. So. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about my album. Not the album that I made, but the album that I requested for this. Yes. An interesting album. Long. A obscure album. An album that not a lot of people know, which is understandable. It is uh, Link, These Are Not Fall Colors. Now, to give a bit of backstory on this band, very little error there is, Link was a post hardcore band that was founded in 1992 in Olympia, Washington by... Vocalist and guitarist Sam Jane, bassist and vocalist James Bertram, and drummer Dave Schneider. They lasted from 1992 to 1994 and only released uh, one album and four singles. So not a very uh, long-lived band, but their album, these, their 1994 album, These Are Not Fall Colors, is personally one of my favorites. It's... um. It's just this band is just interesting to me because they, you know, they didn't last very long. You know, the members kind of just went on to not really do anything that would be incredibly notable. But like, you know, it's just kind of that sort of mysterious aspect to it, which I think definitely kind of, you know, it interests me. That's really all I can say. <laughs> it just it's kind of got that you know you. It's the feeling of, you know, going into a record store in, like, you know, buttfuck nowhere Wyoming and then finding this album just, you know, in, like, the back and just going, like, you know, hmm, what is this? The diamond and then... in the rough. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I think definitely, uh, this album is, uh, pretty much what I would call, uh, because it was part of the sort of Olympia, Washington scene. Yeah. Which was a mixture of like post hardcore and like feminist punk or riot girl. Riot but like girl, that was kind yeah. of like the, the the two notable scenes from Olympia was the post hardcore thing and the uh the riot girl thing, but and they were kind of one of the bands that one of the first bands of that. They didn't obviously they didn't last long, but yeah. There's I get again, there's not a lot of backstory behind this band because like, you know, obviously there wasn't a lot really recorded about them <laughs> there's like very few live videos on youtube and even then they're only like one song but like they exude this kind of energy that you don't see very often or maybe you do but it's just it's just kind of like a lo-fi just noise grinding in your ears and you know 20 year olds screaming in the mic with goggles over their faces <laughs> which is one of the things they did in one of the live videos just wore goggles for no reason <laughs> But, yeah, so, uh, this album, uh, so what did you guys think of it? Uh, I gave it, like, a 6 out of 10. Uh, biggest problem with the album is that all the songs except for one were either three or four minutes long. Yeah. <laughs> I think just, like, for us, talking mostly about experimental albums and albums with long stories means that anything that, like, isn't mars volta level like extreme is just kind of going to be maybe kind of there, there's not a lot to say but like uh i think what i liked i think for the thing is that we can't we can't really do like an episode not episode a, a track, track by, by track. track yeah track by track because you know obviously it would just kind of be the same thing but i think overall thoughts could sort of you know be a thing that we could talk about and for me what i think i like most about this album is first of all the playing it's it's very unique and interesting on all fronts because, you know, you have, you have, firstly, is Dave Snyder's drums. He plays in, like, this really, like, robotic, but in, like, 
I don't know, it's hard to describe. It's like very robotic because he always plays like the same fills over and over again. So you know, like you know his drumming when you when you hear it because it's just kind of the same stuff. But it's it's good and I think in my opinion it fits the music very well. This kind of sort of noisy post hardcore with like melody in certain places and just sort of crazy sounds in others. It definitely gives off like this like this this kind of you know, it's a lo-fi album obviously. And it, it you can you can hear that, and then also uh, the bass playing is very interesting because it's um, it feels like a lot of time. I don't know if you guys would agree, but it feels like a lot of time like the bass is leading more than the guitar. I feel like, like yeah. I don't know if I'd quite say that. It kind of felt like they were both lead guitars. And that's sure. what, and one thing I'll say about this band is that um, even though they were only three people, I think they did a really good job of making like a really kind of hectic and dense sound right in a way i almost think they might have gone too far with it though (laughs) because like i couldn't really tell you like any individual riff from the album because most of it was kind was like pretty noisy or like for me I, i this might be what like my bloody valentine is for you noise like what this album was for me where like it's kind of noisy enough that all that the musical ideas once the song starts going just kind of blend together for me this this is there's a very advanced music theory criticism i have of this album and that's that the intros are the most interesting parts of all the songs (laughs) um and like that's that's kind of a harsh silly music critic thing that's not to say this album is bad but it's just like it's just like for me, for me it's like this album is kind of a no man's land in terms of like mood where it's like it's a little bit too like noisy and hectic to kind of like really like get super immersed into it but then like but then it also just kind of ended up drowning out some of the more like melodic sections for me but that was just me personally i feel uh, like f- oh you go max I, as far as I'm going to say, um, I kind of disagree with you because I have a very clear image of what this album is in my head. Be- I would classify it as this genre in my in my head that I completely made up called People with Legitimate Mental Issues Core. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, is that... Fuck, I, I thought of a joke, but I forgot. Damn it. <laughs> Um, it's like, it's albums like Death Consciousness by Have a Nice Life or Soundtracks for the Blind by Swans. It's music that is very dark and chaotic, um, or it's very dark and gloomy. It's basically, like the name entails, what someone with legitimate mental issues, such as myself, might listen to. Um, to, um, kind of, you know, self-deprecate. And I feel, I feel really, um, so like big self-deprecation and like kind of wallowing in your own anger and misery, um, kind of vibe with this entire album. And, and I think the chaos and, um, the switching between, or like kind of this, like you said, this no man's land between tones, um, works in its favor. Now I do agree with you on the actual quality of this album. It's like a six out of 10, but as for establishing a tone it is excellent right okay um to clarify what i meant when i said immersive because it's not that i didn't have like an image in my head when i listened to the music it's it's more just like it's more just that i I never quite hit the same wavelength as it you know oh yeah like i think it, it's it's kind of like when I when I listen to an album like uh, like the first few Mars Volta albums or like Carnivus or like a My Bloody Valentine album in those situations it's like very I just kind of get lost in the music and that's not quite what happened with this. I feel like for me it's a lot easier for me to sort of get immersed in it because I kind of I kind of like this post hardcore stuff because it's very. It's very punk-ish, but it's, like, not simple. Like, it it does more with it, and it kind of... You can tell that, you know, they... It's not just... I mean, it's lo-fi, but it's, like, a very different type of lo-fi, where it's, like... 
it's a lot more obvious that they they put more thought into sort of some of the riffs and stuff which can be seen in the bass score because a lot of it is just like very sort of just strong sort of sort of i don't even know how to start like very distorted sort of pounding bass that a lot of times like playing more than one string so often it feels a lot more like like you said a guitar which i really like it kind of it's a unique style of bass playing that uh i don't think a lot of other people do i mean it kind of reminds me of the dinosaur junior bass player lou barlow in the kind of way where he would play the, the chord stuff but like you know other than him i don't think i've ever heard that kind of, that kind of bass playing for anyone else it's kind of sort of strong sort of like you know chord heavy you know just like riff bass and i really like it it's um it, it i think it complements the music well where like weak bass lines would just like make this album like fall flat but it, it doesn't it it's it it uh holds its own with the guitar and the thinking about it there is kind of my one issue with the album is that some of the guitars because of the fact that they're so in the back when compared to the bass it kind of gets hard to tell what he's playing a lot of the time yeah which it's which makes sense also because of the fact that apparently according to Wiki, the wikipedia page the band used quote-unquote irregular tunings whatever the hell that means but <laughs> and you could tell because like a lot of it is just like you know really out of tune but i think that's also what makes it really interesting because like you you can't really like tell what he's playing but that kind of builds into the sort of the noisy aspect which i mean maybe you guys didn't like it but i thought it was pretty cool um there one of the rate your music reviews here says that the guitar and bass were tuned down a whole step so i guess so maybe that's what they meant on wikipedia by irregular tuning yeah. <laughs> tuned down a whole step that's like d standards that's not that high but i i don't know <laughs> Well, who but, knows? You know, maybe, maybe it's like they tuned everything down and then just like kind of fucked with a couple of the strings individually. Maybe, or maybe they no, just that, didn't retune the guitar between recording sessions. It's almost yeah. hard to imagine this album being recorded in like more than one session because th this is a very non-studio studio album. It's <laughs> aside from like some of like kind of the electronic noises that are coming in on like the last track here yeah that's another thing i find really interesting about the songs the occasional sort of sort of dive into like sampling stuff like on um like on songs like uh clay fighter and uh, heroes and heroines and uh uber uh U uberima fights they kind of go into like these kind of like elect like loops like with yeah. uh clay fighter it's like this weird kind of like loop of like all these voices kind of playing over and over again and then like here's the heroines it's like another loop but it's like uh it's like some dude's voice along with like this really kind of like poppy sounding like keyboard riff i don't know it's hard to describe but it kind of i really like that those sort of small moments where it just kind of does something that you wouldn't expect because it kind of it's just just really kind of like you feel like you're like walking into like a room and you don't know like what's going on yeah, I think. Yeah, I I kind of wish they took that a little further though. Like, oh uh, yeah, that would be cool though. It, this album, like, it, uh, one album that I could kind of draw a little bit of a comparison with, and that Max did earlier, so which is good, is a uh, Death Consciousness by Have a Knife's Life, which is definitely going for a very different mood since it's kind of like a, it's kind of a shoegaze album. Um, but that album also uses quite a bit of sampling and like, in particular with a lot of the drums and with a lot of like the synthesizers and that album also does not, isn't really like, I would say that it has weird song structures, but not really in that they like have a ton of different sections, but that they tend to have very minimalist sections um but like for me an album like that works because the mood it creates is like so thick whereas like and that's another album where again i can't even really tell what the guitar is playing half the time but like with an album like this it's like the songs are a little bit too short to like get me into that like full kind of mood except the last one which i will say 
if more of the album was like that last song, I think I would have liked it more with like kind of the long fade ins and fade outs with kind of these because the section in the middle where it's more energetic and it's more like the rest of the album, it stands out more on that track than the rest of it because it has something to contrast it. Right. I think definitely I do kind of agree with that because like the last part of this album is really weird in the way that it's much calmer than like the rest of the song or not the rest, but the rest of the album is just like this really kind of like quiet part, which is kind of strumming on the guitar with like either really quiet or like just like bass that just isn't there. Yeah. Along with these really simple drums and it kind of, it gives a very kind of melancholic mood. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I think another, oh, you go next. Um, yeah, it's like, I do think that, um, again, like I said, the mood, um, is very present on this album though i do wish the actual um music was a bit more interesting like it does stand out this band um with like a lot of the things they do on this album stands out from a lot of the other post-hardcore bands that kind of all sound the same um but i i wish they'd like pushed it a little further like ray said i really wish they did um because um I don't know, I can think of a million albums that, like, go very far with it and just kind of um, is completely confident. Because I, I, I guess I'd, I'd say this um, album lacks kind of um, confidence within their musical choices. Yeah, hmm. I feel like this band, I think it's really a shame that they're a one-album band. Like, there's, there's like a Rate Your Music list that says greatest one album bands. Can you tell that I'm browsing Rate Your Music while I do this <laughs> podcast? Um, uh, and, yeah. and, but like, I think that might be the biggest flaw of this album is that there wasn't a follow up. Because yeah. I think they really could have expanded on the sound. I think they could have expanded on the structure. I think... Um, yeah, I just think there's a there's a lot of potential with this band, but I don't think they fully utilized it on this album. <clears throat> yeah, um, which it this, is a shame though. Yeah, the fact that this band was only, and I, I was explaining this earlier in the chat, but like, there's not really a real answer about why this band broke up, and there there is one story kind of on one of the live videos online on YouTube that was posted with this band, there's like a comment that says that the band broke up because some, so one of the band members got like an amateur tattoo on his arm and like that somehow caused the breakup, but they don't provide any evidence or explain like why that would be. <laughs> so it's just like we have this mystery of just like why the band even broke up. But it's, I don't know, it's just weird. Yeah. Especially because, like, I, I, most of the, I think out of the band, like, I think only two of them really went on to do anything else. Yeah, because uh, the vocal guitarist Sam Jane, he went on to form a band called Love is Laughter, which I haven't listened to a lot of, but I've heard they're kind of just straightforward alternative rock. But uh, James Bertram, the bassist, went on to do various things, and one of them was a band called Red Stars Theory, which, um, this is before the pocket, but me and Ray actually listened to one of their albums together, and it's like, would you describe it as, like, kind of post-rock, shoegaze, kind of dream pop? Uh, it's referred to on Rate Your Music as post-rock, comma, slowcore. I think that that those are about the best descriptions possible. Yeah. There's there's a little bit of it like a dream pop influence, but um but yeah, the the album in question there is Life in a Bubble Can Be Beautiful. I gave that a 7, but um th that that was a good 7. That's like a like a yes, I would re-listen to that. So. Yeah. <laughs> so and... I, seven, like, it's one of those ratings that just means nothing, because some people use it to be an average, some people use it to be an above average. Uh, and I believe the drummer, whose name is Dave Schneider, I don't think, because on, uh, what's it, on Discogs, he's only credited on playing, like, some obscure compilation album from a few years back that I cannot find anywhere. So, yeah, I have no idea. But he, suffice to say that the members of this band went on to do other things. He was also like, part of a band uh, called Satisfact. 
on Rate Your Music. That's the only one I can uh, find that he was in. Right. I I didn't. I've never heard of that. So who knows? But I'm trying. To, also, I think um, what's this? Apparently, Sam Jane was also set to play in Modest Mouse at one point. Apparently, according Whoa. to Discogs, but I've I've never heard of that. So that probably is just like a mislabel or something. And uh, Bertram, the bassist, went on to play bass in another uh, Washington band called Sev- uh, 764 Hero, yeah. which is sort of another sort of straightforward alt band. But yeah, I've, I've, I've listened to some of it. It's pretty good. But yeah, so... Yeah, I guess maybe they just broke up because like it didn't really... Because their music didn't really catch on. Which is kind maybe. of a shame, because like... I almost it's like it's kind of sad to think that like there was a time when like that was a deciding factor in whether or not you kept your band together in like the pre-band camp days (laughs) whereas now it's like oh yeah we don't have a very big audience on our band camp but they like us so we'll keep going yeah so but I kind of want to I want to sort of in this with one thing. I actually have the physical copy of this album right here. I'm holding it right now. And I just have to say, I was talking about this earlier in the cut chat, but, like, this album has a really weird cover. Like, yeah. it's... From what... It's basically just, like, the name and the name of the band and the album, and, like, these three, like, really small, grainy picture of them playing live. Like, yeah. that's the entire cover, and it's, like... On the CD cover, you can barely tell what it is, but on the vinyl cover, it's a lot clearer. Because it's pretty clearly just, like, cutouts of, like, a film roll that they just, like, paste it on. So, yeah, it's it's very bizarre, and I don't really get why they would make it that simplistic. Like, you think there'd be more detail, but no. I like it a lot. I do like it, too, yeah. I, I think it, the I think the name of this album is actually really cool. These are not fall colors. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, the reason that they made the cover so weird and minimalist was just because they wanted it to be a very kind of distant feeling. I mean, if you look at most of their album covers that they have, yeah, they're, I, I have they're like... very kind of sparse, except like, they're, like there's a few that are a little bit more, uh, that have a little more detail, but most of them are very just kind of sparse and distant. Yeah, because um, I actually have uh, this this band's entire discography like on the, the small vinyl vinyl prints that they made, and like the first one is literally just like a cutout envelope that they like drew on, like they made like individual copies and like all made them unique. Another one was like they it was like a um it was like a it was like a one of those like laminated folders and they like stamped on it with a wood block. <laughs> like that's literally what it is. And then the wow. other two are actually like actually printed, but it's like yeah. Are those have to say, the um, EPs? <clears throat> it's the one, the one, the split single they did, and uh, two feet in front. Okay. Yeah, I have to say though, also this because I'm I have like the the sort of the fuller thing right now, and like because there actually is like a kind of a lyric sheet inside. There's like all like the song names along these arrows pointing to like these lines, but it's like it's like snippets of the lyrics, and they're like all like crossed out and like like scribbled on. So it's it's like you can't tell what like you know what it's supposed to say, but it's like also because of the fact that this band or not this band that this album has like really weirdly mixed lyrics or not lyrics but mixed vocals like they're like at will like mixed really low in like the mix so you can't even like tell what they're saying. Yeah. The um. <clears throat> one thing I was gonna ask. So the yeah. credit. Um both sam jane and james bertram as vocals did one of them sing okay i was gonna ask if one of them only did backing vocals because i honestly couldn't tell them apart uh they're on some yeah it's kind of like he uh i think on like songs i think on perfect shot uh clay fighter uh and like Umbrina Fight, he like will sometimes play snippets of lead vocals, but like other than that, he's doing backing vocals. So yeah. Okay. And then uh, so and then like uh on the other side, it's this like 
this kind of like disjointed mess of things where there's this one on like the top left there's like a weird drawing of like a what looks like a tree with like blue scribbled on it with the text use a fall color not blue and then like on the right there's like this diary entry i don't need to read it now it's an entry january 5th 1983 dear diary today was a rough day in school today we had a sub boy dot 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 was she a crab we had jim and liberty spelt wrong in jim we got all stars we tied with some other classes they will have to pull out of the hat yesterday i got a checks cube thank you for listening and that's it and then I on the see. bottom yeah and then on the bottom there's like a weird rant i'm gonna try and read it that one bridge we always cross had different stillness today both sides calm and you could almost touch hat still calm i heard dogs music then i saw people in that place i've never been the last thing I, when I was thinking about it, was smelling the smoke, and it was dark, too. Those leaves were burning. Hmm. This is fitter, happier-ass <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> it is It is kind of fitter, happier-ass. Yeah, it's, it's just, like, weird ranting scribbled on. <laughs> but it's just, like, I think to me, that kind of sort of, like, adds to the mysterious factor of this album. Like... Yeah. You just like don't know what it's talking about, and I I love that. It's just it's the kind of again it's the kind of feeling of like finding an obscure album and like knowing nothing of it. I imagine yeah. it's the same feeling that people got when they bought a uh, Spiderland by Slint, just like that very minimalist cover in the the back thing, like you know. Yeah. But I mean, like, yes. um, or maybe something like uh, the first Velvet Underground album, how that only yeah. sold like. I think three hundred albums in the first three years, or something like that. I think it was, no, I think it was like thirty thousand. Maybe it was three like thousand. It, it was not very many. <laughs> yeah, no, it wasn't that very many. But uh, so, is that all thoughts on this album? Um, I have one more. I feel like I've been too mean. I just want to say again that the playing on this is good, um, and. I, the sound they made is pretty unique, um, and I did like the last song quite a bit, but yeah. just overall it didn't really congeal into anything really special for me. That's okay. Yay. But uh, you, Max? Um, I just want to say that... Uh, fuck. I just want to say <laughs> that... Um, you know what's a better genre than post-hardcore? Fucking what? Screamo. And I'm not talking about Screamo as in, like, the Hot Topic bullshit. I'm talking about <laughs> actual Screamo. Because I think it takes what um, post-hardcore is trying to do and takes it to, like, um, a whole new level of, like, energy and chaos. And um, just it has a lot more emotion packed into it, which... I, I don't know. I guess I would rather listen to a Screamo album than a post-hardcore album, which I guess contributes to my opinion of this album. I feel like you might uh, as well just listen to both genres because both both of those genre terms are so muddled that yeah. it's like... <laughs> yeah. Like, people calling Esting Alexandria post-hardcore. Like, what, <laughs> what the fuck? I, do people do that? Sometimes, I don't know. Like, I don't know if it's just because I watched a lot of Jared Dines in the back in like a couple of years ago, but like he would sometimes call stuff hardcore, even though he but he wouldn't call it hardcore punk, even though that's people will call hardcore punk hardcore sometimes. It, who fucking knows? It's genre names that are weird. Indeed. Yeah, but uh, this is a short episode because we had a lot of st stuff happen. But uh, so we're probably gonna release this and the Amputecture album in like the same day. Yeah. Yeah. But uh This is a bonus then we'll, episode. Yeah, but then we'll we'll get back on track uh next week when we talk about the next Mars Volta album, but you're gonna have to wait for that. Yeah. Next time on the Esoteric Music Death Spiral. Alright guys, do your sign offs and make sure that they'll last us more than forty five seconds so we can make this over half an hour. Uh I have all of Link's discography 
on either disc or vinyl, and I think that's cool because no one probably my age in this entire area does, unless I do meet someone like that, and then it'll be a it'll be a match made in heaven. I don't have that, but what I do have is um, Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses on CD somewhere buried in my closet. I don't know why I have that. I don't even like that album. <laughs> Listen to Relationship of Command and Death Consciousness at the same time instead of this. <laughs> Good. All right. Good. Esoteric Death Spiral signing out. Yeah.